and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision, and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today was raised as a son by one of Tibet's greatest spiritual and meditation masters of the last century. He was educated at Delhi and Cambridge and has played a pivotal role in helping transplant Tibetan Buddhism outside Tibet with the community and through the community in exile and in particular in the West. He's perhaps best known in recent years for his definitive book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. I'm delighted to welcome Sogyal Rinpoche. Welcome. Um, your uh, book was uh, quite sensational in the sense that uh, not only was it uh, extremely successful on the bestseller lists, uh, but be managed to talk about death uh, and, and yet be a bestseller. Uh, something that we tend to put aside and, and, and ignore and, and, and not engage in conversation about. Uh, why is death, in a sense, so important? I think um, life and death is a part of a whole. But unfortunately, we don't look at that. Uh, we become very much therefore attached to life and deny and reject death which becomes our ultimate fear. In fact, when you look in beneath the fear, the fear of not having looked into ourselves. I often say that death is like a mirror in which the true meaning of life is very much reflected. In fact, if I might say a little bit, you see, I began to write this book. Um, I came to the West in the early 70s. In fact, I had the honor to um, uh, host or to help with His Holiness's first visit to the West in 1973 with the meeting with the Pope Paul VI. You refer to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, of course, yes. And then he's coming to, in England, I was then in Cambridge, he came there. And uh, then after that, many of my own teachers, such as the great master called Dujum Rinpoche, I think we can say, who is also His Holiness's own teacher, came in and I served as their translator. Mm -hmm. And as I traveled to many different countries and I saw there was a tremendous hunger and thirst for wisdom from the East, and particularly the Tibetan teachings. But what I felt was that it was very kind of scattered information, and then also the translations were not really provided fully so that we could translate the words, but not really the meaning. So over the years, I tried to really, in, really try to find a way that you maintain the authenticity of the teachings, but also translate in the way that's both accessible and open. And so as I was began to teach, then death and dying was a very important subject in the Buddhist um, path and teaching. So as I began to address, I was invited to many of the conferences with near death research as well as the hospice movement was which is a caring for the dying. And so out of all these experience I began to write this book, which is a both you could say an A B C of spirituality, because I find that in the West there's not that background, and I felt that maybe to spell out the basic principles in a very simple way, at the same time to really look at death, not as an enemy, but as a friend. Uh, I, I remember as a child being uh, terrified of death myself, uh, and it wasn't as much sort of my own death, but the death of people close to me. Uh, there was a feeling of, uh, you know, what was death? Would there be abandonment, uh, aloneness? Uh, these are just memories. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it essentially that, 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 in your experience of teaching so many people, what is it that people fear about death? I think the, really the fear of death is the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And also fear of n losing all that. I mean, is this, and particularly also, as I said earlier, is that. Uh, uh, I often said to people, is if you're worried about dying, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't worry, you, we all die, will die successfully. <laughs> but then, why are we afraid of death? It's because the beneath the fear of death is fear of looking into ourselves. So the death, in fact, teaches us how to come to terms with the life. And to really, for example, in the, among the Christian contemplatives, there's a saying, memento mori, remember dying. Because if we remember dying, then we might remember what life or living is. So therefore, in all spiritual traditions, reflecting on death 
is almost equal to mm -hmm. meditating on God. Mm -hmm. Because it really makes us look beyond our material, this ordinary world, mm -hmm. to the state of more deeper meanings. That's why when you really mm -hmm. reflect on death, and really, for example, in the teaching we speak of, the death is real, comes without mourning, this body will be a corpse. You know, when we begin to look into death and realize that how death lives with us every moment. I mean, we can, for example, breathe out and we cannot breathe in. That's the death. So, as we look into death that way, what it does, it, it helps us to sort out our priorities and makes us find really the meaning of life. Death really helps us. And then, it's by really looking deeply into death, we come to really realize our innermost nature and therefore come to realize something that transcends and that is beyond birth and death. The, the Tibetan tradition, of course, has perhaps the most uh, sophisticated uh, writings and teachings uh, on the processes of uh, dying. Uh, and um, how important, how necessary uh, is an awareness uh, of, of the process? Uh, is it something that is unique? Or, or specific to the Tibetan tradition that requires this? Well, in, in Tibetan tradition, this is something that is emphasized. And it really, in some ways, when you come to understand the process of dying, it helps us to prepare. But then, of course, in the modern kind of a setting, like in a hospital, it's difficult sometimes for us to detect all these processes. But what I find it's very interesting is that, that in the process of dying, there are two, what we call, dissolutions. The outer dissolution of elements. But there is the inner dissolution of our mind, in a sense, to put it more simply. And what is extraordinary is that it said that all the anger and the desire and the ignorance, that is to say, all the thoughts and emotions that obscure our inherent nature, because what is the fundamental view in Buddhism is that each and every one of us has, has as our essential nature, the Buddha, that pervades all, which I mean in Hinduism or other religions speaks of God. That pervades us. But then unfortunately, that true nature, which is like the sky, has been obscured by the cloud, like ignorance. But what is also a wonderful message is that when we die, all these, not only our body die, but the mind with its all its obscurations die. So therefore there is an opportunity if we, 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 if we are well prepared at that particular moment. There is a moment when the, all the dissolution of ignorance, desire and anger, when they die, there comes a moment of clear light. At that moment if you can let go and surrender, then in that moment it is said there's liberation. But of course, it sounds easy, but it's difficult. Mm -hmm. But this happens to all of us. But unfortunately, not every one of us are aware of it. So in my book, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, which is really based on the, the really the entire teaching on the, what is called the Pardos, which comes from many great masters, particularly Padmasambhava, who brought the teaching of Buddha to Tibet. You've mentioned sort of these two layers of uh, dissolution in a sense, the, the gross, the physical body and then the subtle. Um, the, the dissolution of the subtle mind takes time. Uh, it doesn't happen at the, at the instant of physical death. Yes. Uh, we have uh, now almost a universal tradition uh, in most countries, most cultures, uh, driven largely perhaps by the practicality of it, of burying or, or cremating our dead uh, almost as soon as they die or within a, a fairly short time. Uh, is this, you think, sort of counter to enabling this process of experiencing clear light and one's growth and evolution at the time of death? Well, that's one of the reasons why in our tradition, for example, it's kind of encouraged that the body be left for at least three days if possible. Or rather, in our kind of tradition, and I think it's many of the spiritual traditions, is that very much uh, that uh, the proper practices are done before, in a sense, the body is disturbed. Uh, generally sp speaking, that it could be that this process may take maybe very quickly or could take up to three days. So hence, I think uh, uh, we kind of recommend it to, to have that period as a 
uh, an opportunity for that process to happen because as you were saying earlier that in the Tibetan teachings is that uh, there is the two processes the inner process the innermost process may continue even after we may be pronounced as clinically dead so it's kind of evident of sometimes many great yogis you know great practitioners you find it after they've passed away that you know uh, there's still there's a warmth and sense of that presence and so many indications that still uh, and in particularly in uh, our tradition is that uh, that the uh, master he remains in meditation he unite his mind with in the in the clear light remain in that and then it is said that he accomplishes all the work that he has not accomplished or rather he directs his blessings to the whole world and so it is during those moments that it says sometimes when a student of that teacher could unite his or her mind with the master and thereby receiving blessings so it's considered a very important moment and this is particularly important for a practitioner but in the case of an ordinary person I mean it become accustomed to you know but I think what is important before is that we in our tradition that what a practice called power which is the transference of conscience which is to direct the conscience into the kind of the into the into the uh, heaven or into the you know um, before until that is done the body is not touched what would you sort of uh, uh, recommend to someone who wasn't a Buddhist who wasn't a practitioner uh, and was approaching uh, death himself uh, or was, uh, had someone very close to them uh, to, uh, who was approaching death. What would be sort of uh, a word of uh, uh, advice? Because I think the processes that, that we're talking about <laughs> require lifetimes of practice to perfect. True. Is there a rule of thumb? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think to put it very simply, this mm -hmm. very great master called Padmasambhava, mm -hmm. who is the author of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, mm -hmm. He said, when, now when the moment of death dawns upon me, mm -hmm. I will abandon grasping, yearning, and attachment, mm -hmm. and enter undistracted into the clear awareness of the teaching, and eject my consciousness into the space of unborn rigpa. And as I leave this body of flesh and compound body of flesh and blood, I will know to be trans to illusion. To put it simply, is that when the really moment of death comes, what's most important is to, when you're helping somebody to create an environment, particularly like, for example, like in the West. Mm -hmm. You see, because sometimes that is the only moment sometimes for people to come to terms with. So really you provide a very loving and caring environment in which the person can really come to reflect on their life and find meaning so that they don't die empty-handed. So it's very much to help them to let go, help them to come to terms with their lives, to let go of attachment and aversion. And that's why it's very important at the moment is to giving love. And particularly for spiritual practitioner is accompanying them, is not only giving love, but with the, very much with wisdom love. That is to say that the love that emanates from really from deep compassion when you do that i find it really helps the person to just let go of the fear like just as sometimes when you're really anxious if you have a very wonderful person warm loving and somebody you trust you know he gives you really confidence that that's what we need really need. and then to really let go of all her particularly you see all the like negativity to ask for forgiveness and to keep your heart and mind pure and then unite your mind with wisdom mind of buddhas or with for example for hindu practitioner with god just as with with gandhi you know says ram ram you know like really you know and then you see unite your mind with the wisdom mind of the buddhas and then rest in the essential nature mind really those three things keep your let go of attachment and aversion that means to keeping your heart mind pure unite your mind with the wisdom mind of the Buddhas and then to rest in the nature mind. I think much of our civilization, and certainly the globalized civilized culture of the West that is permeating us, is, is obsessed with, with seeking, nurturing, cultivating love, but love of a very different kind that seems to lead more to, to, to suffering, to attachment, to what have you. But yet love is that universal aspiration in some ways. 
the Buddhist tradition talks a great deal about love too and talks about compassion. What is the difference? What is this love? How is this love that you talk about different? I think generally when we talk about love, it's, um, it's very much sometimes, you know, we love our friends but not our enemies. It becomes a little bit limited. Whereas this kind of love is a limitless love, which comes through actually deep reflection. Because when you really look very deeply, of course, those we love in a life are close to us, but even the enemies. And if really, really, when you really look deeply, like particularly from a karmic point of view, this life has not been the only life. And in all our past lives, we've been connected from the time immemorial with everyone. So there have been our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters. We've been through everything. <laughs> well, I try and, and, and say, say cultivate love for the enemy, but I love my wife differently. <laughs> yes, it's true. Uh, in, 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 in what ways? Uh, I think generally, you see, <laughs> generally when you love your, like, for example, your family, particularly like your wife, it's kind of, that's a love has a, it's slightly different. It's kind of, there's a little bit of passion, mm -hmm. a little bit of a kind of an attachment that is involved. Mm -hmm. When we talk about this kind of love, it's more loving kindness, mm -hmm. which comes from, like, for example, this is very much through training of mind. Mm -hmm. When we work with this, and when we really reflect, for example, the practice of like Lojong or training of the mind when we do that, when we realize that all beings are mm -hmm. connected together, there comes what is called the universal love that mm -hmm. comes through. Mm -hmm. But this is also something when through meditation, when we let our mind just quietly settle. Mm -hmm. Because you see, what happens is this, uh, in the midst of our, all our confusion, mm -hmm. that in fact our love is very much blocked. So that's mm -hmm. what, when we let our mind just quietly settle, mm -hmm in the state of natural ease, you know. And then from that kind of calm mm -hmm. and that clear state that then we, all the negativity mm -hmm. and uh, diffused. Mm -hmm. And then we connect with our fundamental goodness. Mm -hmm. And as we connect really deeply with our true nature and go a little bit beyond our ego, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then suddenly we begin to realize that all beings are the same. We begin to really feel, I and mean, this is the mm -hmm. such a message that he's in Dalai Lama mm -hmm. so profoundly. I mean, mm -hmm. I can in no way mm -hmm. express like his holiness. His holiness expressed so wonderfully. Mm -hmm. That's what, what the his holiness message. Mm -hmm. Very much that you see when you begin to realize that, then you begin to really feel that we're all same. And then there comes a universal love. There is really the sameness. Mm -hmm. There's not the separateness. And then this is sometimes can be realized through really through personal reflection and meditation. Mm -hmm. And then when you realize that there comes a love that really transcends mm -hmm. and a kind of a universal love mm -hmm. which is freeing, which is liberating mm -hmm. and which is source of happiness for all beings, mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned meditation and you've mentioned training the mind. Uh, meditation in sort of common uh, English uh, ja uh, usage is that you know, meditation is contemplating on anything. You can, you can meditate on um, war, you can meditate on a whole range of things and it just means that you think about um, in, in, in the practices and traditions that, that you teach and recommend, what is meditation? Well, can you have a little time to talk about yes. that? Yes, fine. So <laughs> I think this is the important one, mm -hmm. is that I think you see in the Buddhist path, I mean, first of all, you see, I think if you essentialize the teaching of the Buddha, mm -hmm. it's boiled down to three. Commit not a single unwholesome action. Cultivate the wealth of virtue to tame this mind of ours. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Commit not a single unwholesome action means to abandon all the unwholesome, negative, and harmful actions mm -hmm. which are the cause of suffering for ourselves and the world. Mm -hmm. Cultivate with the wealth of virtue is to adopt the positive, beneficial actions which are the cause of happiness mm -hmm. for ourselves and in the world. As one great Buddhist master called Shantideva said, all the happiness there is in this world mm -hmm. comes from thinking of others. All the suffering there is in this world comes from thinking of oneself. Mm -hmm. But then, on the third statement of the Buddha, which is the most important, mm -hmm. is to tame this mind of ours. Mm -hmm. Because you realize on a deeper level, mm -hmm. is the mind is that which harms and helps. Mm -hmm. The mind is really, the, both our body and speech are just subservient to the mind. Mind is the boss. Mind is the universal ordering principle, creative happiness, 
creative suffering. Do you use the word tame the mind consciously or is it train the mind? Train the mind, I would say. Mm -hmm. Train the mind, you see. Mm -hmm. Because mind is universal ordering principle, it's creative happiness, creative suffering, it's creative what we call samsara and also nirvana. And yet you teach that the essential nature of the mind is pure, is clear, yes. is wholesome. So that's one of the reasons why we need to really work with the mind, because at the moment it's like mind, as one master put it, is when mind turned outwardly lost in its projection is samsara. Mm -hmm. Whereas mind and inwardly recognizing two nature is nirvana. Mm -hmm. At the moment we are And so the whole thing is to bring mind home mm -hmm. and allow our mind just quietly to stay. As one master put it, rest in natural great peace. Mm -hmm. This exhausted mind, mm -hmm. beaten helplessly by karma mm -hmm. and neurotic thoughts, mm -hmm. like the relentless fury of the pounding waves mm -hmm. in the infinite ocean of samsara. Mm -hmm. So when we let our mind quietly settle like a glass of muddy water, mm -hmm. if you keep it still, the dirt will settle and clarity will manifest. When we let our mind just quiet, that's why in the Buddhist path of meditation, mm -hmm. you begin first with what is called shamatha, mm -hmm. or tranquility, or mm -hmm. calm abiding. Mm -hmm. Through that, which is very much a, a practice of mindfulness, because as you know, mm -hmm. that is because of, uh, because of distraction, mm -hmm. and because of the mind is scattered, that's why mm -hmm. the antidote to that is mindfulness and concentration. Mm -hmm. So that through the practice of mindfulness, that's where you do occupy your mind with one object, like in, in the image of Buddha, or watching the breath. Mm -hmm. And as we practice that really, you know, skillfully, mm -hmm. quietly, then what happened? Through that process, our ordinary mind is purified. Mm -hmm. And purified, and then the clear insight of the vipassana, mm -hmm. or the wisdom that realizes egolessness dawns. That means the grasping ego tendencies dissolve. All the fragmented aspect of our mind mm -hmm. comes home the negativity and all the aggression is diffused. That's why I feel it's one of the highest form of inner disarmament. And then we will come to touch with our fundamental goodness, what we call Buddha nature or Bodhicitta. And then from that, then really, from that state, then comes a tremendous like a openness, you see. It's like almost our ordinary mind kind of dies. That's also what happens at the moment of death, is the ordinary mind dies. And what dawns is our wisdom mind a compassion mind. And then mind is like not the ordinary mind, is the transcendental state where it's no longer feel grasping. And from that comes a tremendous compassion for all beings and tremendous also devotion for the Buddhas and the teachings very much. And so it is very much through that meditation, initially of course, it's working through using an object or occupying our mind with for example, like a breath, for example, but then gradually, that's only a skillful means that helps us to go beyond ourselves to reach to the state of transcendence into the, nat into the true nature. And that's what when Milarepa said that, you know, in fear of death, I took to the mountains and again and again, I meditated on the uncertainty of our of death, now capturing the fortress of the deathless, unending nature mind, all fear of death is, is done and over with, is that because you see, if you say that if everything dies, mm -hmm. if everything is impermanent, and what is that we can rely upon? Mm -hmm. We realize that our ordinary mind and ordinary this world is changing. Mm -hmm. you know? But then what we realize that there is something beyond this, mm -hmm. you know, just like the, I think the example sometimes which is very helpful is cloud and the sky. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately with us is because we think that the cloudy mm -hmm. sky is really the sky, but in actual fact, when you take a plane, mm -hmm. go beyond that, you find there's an infinite sky that's mm -hmm. never ever touched by the clouds. How important is a moral, ethical framework uh, to the pursuit of uh, meditation, to the practice of meditation? Because we do see uh, a lot of spiritual masters um, uh, who aren't always able to, well, let's say, let's just say, stray, mm -hmm. it is also assumed in many traditions that once you reach a certain level of enlightenment or insight, you're no longer governed by traditional notions of ethics and morality. In the Hindu tradition, you have a very structured approach where you start with yama, niyama, the do's and the don'ts. How does uh, the Buddhist Tantrayana tradition See, approach this? That really, the ethical is really the very much the ground. As sometimes you see a, this great master Padmasambha said, my view is as spacious as the sky, 
but my respect to laws of cause and effect is as fine as a grain of flour. It's very much that sometimes you see when you have a high view, if you really have a too high view, then you have even more respect for the laws of cause and effect. But I think it's sometimes a mistake is that when you have a high view, you can be like a drunken by that. And then if you go and not be ethical, then it is called losing the view in action, which is one of the greatest faults. <laughs> How often does a, does, does a master use sort of uh, uh, initiations, you have a lot of students, a lot of teachings. Uh, is, is there a parallel to our tradition where you evaluate whether a student has reached a certain uh, level of ethical commitment, ethical framework before he starts on these more complex practices? I think it's very much first. I really first. I think very important as His Holiness always speaks about important. His Holiness Dalai Lama speaks about the importance of being a good human being. First, you develop very much to you see to develop the the basic the human values and to really. For example, when I work with students, one of the first thing to really check is that the the basic nature to develop the good heart to let go of all the negative aspect, when that is more sure and then when you can rely on that person, when you become reliable in that way, then you can then be transmitted the higher teachings. That's why sometimes higher teaching not easily given mm -hmm. is because that it, if it get into the wrong hand, it could be misused. Mm -hmm. It's very important therefore that first of all it has to be that person has a very sound, you develop that person's character, mm -hmm. or, you understand? It's very much, that's a very important thing you develop, and what then is, you share. What is a, a enlightened spiritual master like yourself, a Rinpoche? Well, I'm not, I'm what, aspiration, <laughs> what aspiration do you have for yourself? Well, I think for me, I'm in no way, I'm neither learned nor am I realized in any way. So what I try to do is to study more these teachings. I, I have one of my, my teachers, many of my teachers have passed away, but still I have, like His Holiness, many teachers of still life, I continually to study and practice to, to become better and better. And I feel so many things I need to still work with myself to progress also. There's a long way to go. <laughs> well, thank you very much for today. This thank has been you. a great blessing. Thank you.